And there's a reason it's a little bit different from what the scripture reading was earlier. From Romans chapter 10 verse 14 was the main thing I wanted read this morning, but it was good to have all the things that led up to it. And in Romans 10 14, it is the reminder for us that there is a work to be done. Because Paul says in Romans 10 14, before that he says, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved, but how then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? It would be easy to just look at that last word, preacher, and see that as the way we look at that. We look at preacher and we see a position. We see uh, a noun, if you will. If you say preacher, people think you're talking about a person. The original Greek word that is used in the scripture is the word keruso. And keruso does not, it does not refer to a position. Rather, it appeals and it refers to an action. It is not a noun, it is a verb. Keruso is someone who heralds the word of God. In the time before we had microphones and amplifiers and speakers, it was someone who was willing to shout the word of God. And that is what we are all called to do. And I'm reminded of it, the great need for the gospel to go out. I see it. I'm so glad that on the back of the bulletin it had all the different positions that are needed in order for Vacation Bible School at this church to be an effective ministry, to be a worthwhile ministry to reach its audience because... The harvest is great, but the laborers are few. And there is a need for us to go out and proclaim the gospel. And it's easy, I think, to look at the outside world and look at the things that we're dealing with, not just in this country, but in the world as a whole, and see darkness and see sin. And it is our natural sinful instinct to sit there and say, well, right now we're just going to hunker down And we're just going to hold tight to what we have. There's no need to evangelize. There's no need to go out and get chewed out and cussed out and all these things. Let's just kind of hold it to ourselves and we'll hold firm until the Lord comes back. And that is not what we have been commanded to do by Scripture. We have been commanded to go out and herald the Word of God and preach the gospel and share the gospel. It is not just for a position, but rather it is an activity that is demanded of us. It is an action that requires us to do so. And I've heard all the time, I've heard some guys say, well, you know, how do I know if I'm supposed to go out and do it today? Is it only on specific days or specific times? Is it of a specific age? Or where am I, you know, what is the requirement? When should I be doing this? And I come up with a foolproof system as to when you should be sharing the gospel. All you have to do is blink. If you blink your eyes and when you awaken them once again and you don't see heaven, you don't see St. Peter, you do not see Christ looking you face to face, then it is a day and a time to preach and proclaim the gospel, the good news. There is a greater need for it every day because not only are there false gospels going out, But there are things that take the gospel and try to add to them. Different things have come into the house of God and have tried to corrupt the gospel. People have taken the word gospel and have attached it to things that are not the gospel. They have attached prosperity to it. They have attached health and wealth to it. They have attached things like just be a good person and that's good enough. The good person gospel. Or give enough money. You give enough money, you'll be saved. The good money gospel. These are false. And I will show you in Scripture how you can refute not only the false gospels, but you can go forward with the true gospel. And it is the easiest place in your Bible to find because any half Christian knows John 3.16. All you need to do is add two verses on either side of it and you have the gospel. As it says right here in John chapter 3, starting in verse 14. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, 
that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already, because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. This is the word of the Lord. In these five verses, you see five different things. They all points to the good news. It is the gospel. This is what it is. At the counterfeit office at the U.S. Treasury, they do not spend time studying fake money. What they do is they study money so diligently and so on purpose that they can tell when the slightest little fiber is out of place and they can tell when someone has faked the money because there are 10 million different ways to counterfeit something but the best way to hold true to something is to know it inside and out and how simple the gospel truly is that it is not to be made complicated it is simple it is so simple starting in verse 14 And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. What is Jesus referring to in Numbers 21? The Israelites, as had been so many times, had been deliberately disobedient. And serpents had been sent among them, and the serpents were biting and killing the Israelites. So what did Moses do in his mercy? He made a bronze serpent and the command went out that anyone bit by a serpent, if you would just look at this bronze serpent, you would be saved from a sure death. It was a way out of deserved death for deliberate disobedience before God. And Jesus references this. As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. The Son of Man must be lifted up in order to save the sinner from a deserved death. He must be lifted up. It's why when Simon Peter tried to tell Jesus, Lord, I will will not let any harm be done to you. Jesus said, get behind me, Satan. Because even though Peter meant well in protecting his Lord, He had to go to the cross to atone for our sins. It had to be done because man cannot redeem himself. Man cannot redeem himself. He has to have a Savior. He has to have an atonement. And in verse 14, we see the requirement for an atonement. Something must pay the price. Why? Because a righteous and holy God who occupies heaven, the high and holy places where he dwells, says in Isaiah. For he dwells in a high and holy place. A perfect and righteous God does not tolerate sin in his house, where he dwells. And because he will not tolerate evil, because he is holy and righteous, you must have an atonement. You had to have an atonement. And that is what Jesus is. Even so, must the Son of Man be lifted up. Not even so, might the Son of Man be lifted up. Even so, must the Son of Man be lifted up. There must be an atonement. The piper must get paid. And in His love for us, God has provided... That atonement, I think back to Genesis 22 when Abraham took his only son up on the mountain. All he had was Isaac. He waited years and years and years, believed his wife was never going to have a child, and God blessed him with a child. And then God told him, take that child up on the mountain. He is going to be sacrificed. Could you imagine the angst that he felt taking his only son up on the mountain and knowing what God had commanded him to do? And he built the altar and he had Isaac strapped down on the altar. And at the last minute, God called out. 
to Abraham. He said, here I am, Lord. And God provided a ram caught in the thicket. He provided the sacrifice. God provided it. Man did not provide it. God provided it. And as we now sit here, we must have an atonement. Jesus says it is a requirement that there must be an atonement. That is what the Son of Man is. That's why that spot on that mountain where Abraham was is called Jehovah Jireh. The Lord will provide. And he has provided an atonement. Because an atonement must be made. So there we see in verse 14, there is a requirement of atonement. Verse 15, that whosoever believeth in him, Jesus, should not perish, but have eternal life. That whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. This is the promise. It is the shortest of the five verses, but might be the greatest. It is the promise put forth by the word of God himself in the flesh. That whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. Faith placed in Jesus spares the sinner of rightful Punishment. Man deserves punishment, but faith in Jesus spares the sinner. In 1 John chapter 5, verse 12, it is reminded to us like this. And this is the record God hath given to us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. He that hath the Son hath life, and he that hath not the Son hath not life. Life is only in Jesus. Eternal life is only in Jesus. There are not multiple ways to God. And there are not multiple mediators before God Almighty. We have one God and we have one mediator before God, the man Christ Jesus. That whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. So there is the promise. Second thing we've seen. The promise of eternity. Verse 16. Verse everybody knows. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. I look at verse 16 and I see the mercy of God that I do not deserve as a sinner. My back has been to God so many times in life. I was born with my back to God. And yet, even in my defiance, God loves me. For God so loved the world. This is a picture of God's love that even though mankind has turned its back on God, God still so loved the world that he would sacrifice his own to the worst death there could be so that a sinner that was standing at the foot of the cross spitting on him and laughing on him might be able to turn to a later date and call him Lord and bow down before him and in him have that promise of verse 15. It is a lot of love to show someone love that hates your guts. It is hard to love someone that hates your guts. It's hard as a human. It is a love that only God could have and show. In this piece of scripture, where it talks about for God so loved, the same word is used to describe Jesus' love for his own disciples. Before he washed their feet at the Last Supper in John chapter 13, it talks about how much Jesus loved his disciples. It is a level of love we could never know. No matter, I know we all, any one of us that have kids, we love our kids. And those of us that are old enough to have grandkids, we love our grandkids. But even as much as you love them, God loves more. God loves differently. Anyone that's been in the world long enough knows that human love What we consider love, so many times it is fickle. So many times it is conditional. We might love somebody, but they do us wrong enough, 
We will eventually say, I've had enough. And I will leave. I've seen so many women victims of domestic abuse. And 10 million people will try to come up to them and say, why don't you just leave him? Why don't you just go away? And there's something in their head that is still clicking that man, I, I love the man. It is terrible to see someone who loves somebody so much that they will be willing to take those kind of beatings and that abuse. And not just the physical, but the verbal and the emotional that can come as well. And yet still, some people find a way to love even through that. Or to love a husband or a wife who has no relationship with God. To go to church on a Sunday by yourself as if you were single with a ring on your finger. And that even though your spouse looks at you and says, well, you go ahead. I got no use for those people. I got no use for religion. Someone who hates what you go and do and yet that person still loves you enough to pray for you and pray for your soul. It is a beautiful and wonderful thing to see. But even that level of love is topped by how much God loves us. That even though we hate and despise him, that God loves us. Revelation 1.5 puts it like this. And from Jesus Christ who is the faithful witness and the first begotten of the dead and the prince of the kings of the earth unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. He paid for us in blood. He did not pay for us by standing over us with his hand outstretched and sprinkling a little bit of water on us. He paid for us in his blood. That not only the Son loved us enough to go to the cross and fulfill what the Father had for Him, but that God loved us enough to sacrifice His own for us. That is a level of love you will not find anywhere else. Because everywhere else, you will only find a fickle love. No one loves you like God loves you. That God loves you enough to seek to spare you from a death that you deserve. This is what we must go forward with. Verse 17. So right there, verse 16, we see the mercy of the Lord, the love of the Lord. Verse 17. For God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. This is the mission of Jesus. This is the mission of Jesus. This is why he was here. Jesus was not here on a bombing raid. You see those depictions in movies of, of wars where they go out and they send out a bombing raid. They send out multiple planes, cargo bays full of bombs to drop them on enemy territories. And those bombs utterly destroy and they wipe out life and they tear things up. They kill people. They destroy homes. They destroy environments. That is not what Jesus was here to do. His mission was a mercy mission. He was here as the greatest extension of God's mercy that he would send him not just to die on a cross. That would have been enough. But he sent him for long enough that he would be baptized and that he would go forward and face temptation and he would overcome temptation. And in doing so, showing us how to overcome temptation. And he would give him three years worth of time to minister and to heal the sick and to give sight to the blind and to cure the lepers. If he'd have just went to the cross and died, it would have been enough. But he gave more. He gave more. He gave more of himself. He gave himself away. He gave miracles. He healed those who did not deserve. He healed those that were waiting on some other God. He healed those that didn't even know he was God until after the miracle was done. The Samaritan woman at the well did not acknowledge that he was the Christ until after the fact that she finally realized it and her eyes were opened. It's one thing to sit there and say, well, he only saved Christians. There were no Christians. There were no followers of Christ. He was not just to the Jews. He was also to the Gentiles, to the Ethiopian who was sick, that he healed their sickness. 
He is not just a God of the Jews. He is a God of the Gentiles as well. He is the God over all. And he is the greatest extension of God's mercy. And his mission is made plain in verse 17. The mission of Jesus. For God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Is Jesus a righteous judge? Is Jesus a righteous judge? Could he walk into a place and see sin and condemn it? Yes, he can. He did so in the temple. He saw them taking tables and taking animal sacrifices where they were sitting there jacking up the price of lambs and doves and these things to take advantage of people that had pilgrimed to Jerusalem. He saw his father's house, which was supposed to be a house of prayer, says in Isaiah 56, and they had taken it and turned it into a den of thieves. And he did not just walk by, but he went in there and straightened the record. And he not, did not do so out of some human emotion. He did so out of righteous judgment. And yet... He loved them enough to correct them. And those same people that he was condemning for turning his house into a den of thieves, he went to the cross for those people. He went to the cross for the homeless guy walking down the street that the only time you ever have a conversation with him is when he's asking you for money. He went to the cross for him, just like he went to the cross for the person that sits in church every Sunday, just like he went to the cross for the person who is living in sin that needs to repent. He went to the cross for us all because he was on a mercy mission. He was not on a bombing raid. He gave everything he had. There's a thing, there's a commentary I was reading about why the pain was so bad for Jesus. It seems like when we read scripture, there's so much more about his pain and what he was going through. Obviously, Crucifixion is a horrible, terrible way to die. It was so bad that Roman citizens would never be crucified by Rome. They got away with this because he was a Jew. But why, was, why does his seem so much worse than the other two up on the cross? Because Jesus was an innocent man. He had no crimes of his own to pay for. He was paying and everything that was put upon him was our sins. That's why it was so bad. That's why it was as bad as it was. That's why it says that his visage was beaten more than any other man. He was almost re- unrecognizable. He had nothing left to give. That's why it is so graphic and why it is so horrible when you read it and it makes you cry when you see some depiction of it that is biblically true because he was not going for some crime he was going for my sins he was going for our sins that's what he was bearing on the cross was the sins of others because he had not committed any makes his sacrifice mean that much more in first john chapter 2 it is worded like this if any man sin we have an advocate with the father jesus christ the righteous And he is the propitiation for our sins. Not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. Later on in chapter 4, verse 14, it says, And we have seen and do testify that the Father sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. He was bearing the sins of the world on that cross. So in verse 17, the mission of Jesus. And now, verse 18. He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already, because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. This is, this is the hard part here. This is, this is that hard part on the back end that needs to be shared. This is why it is so important to proclaim the gospel, to preach the gospel 
to do things that proclaim the gospel, to go and visit people and to share the gospel at your work, at your senior citizen home, at the bingo hall, at the gas station, at Thanksgiving and Christmas and happy birthdays and all that stuff you do if you're ever in interaction with other people. This is why it is so important to share and proclaim the gospel because there is a consequence. He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. A guilty verdict and punishment await the unbeliever. Literally, it means to have negative belief, to have no belief. And it results in condemnation. It says he is condemned already. In chapter 3, verse 36 it says, He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life, and he that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. This is the gospel. This is the good news. This is the truth. You would be amazed how many Christians or so-called Christians. Some, I don't call them all Christians. I saw, I call some of them churchins. And you know what? I, I used to be one of them. I was a churchin. I wasn't a Christian. I wasn't following Christ. I was just following what we do at church. Pastors up there preaching. Okay, I'll take his word for it. Used to leave my Bible in a pew because I was not I had no intention of reading it at the house, so I might as well just leave it where I sit. I had a Bible in my father's house that had more dust on it than any piece of furniture because it always sat on a coffee table. It never got opened and read and shared. There is a need everywhere for the gospel. There is a need not just in this nation and in this church, but in the world for the gospel. Because these 2,000 some years later, the fruits of this mercy mission by Jesus are still available. The day of salvation is still. No matter how bad things are going, no matter how worse things are going to get, and I firmly believe that they are going to get worse, there is still a need for the gospel. And there is a need for Christians to know what the gospel is without a Bible in your hand. We are commanded by God to hide, hide God's word down in our heart. Because you might not have your Bible at your desk at work, but you better be able to proclaim the gospel by memory. I'm not saying word for word, but you better be able to proclaim it. You better be able to share it. You better be able to do it without sitting there thinking about it. It's one of those things that, you know what gets politicians in trouble at debates? When it looks like they're having to think about what they're saying. They sit there and, you know, they might have to sit there and wonder for a little bit, uh, what's my response on this question? Brother, you got to know. You got to know. I don't care. You, you can know the Ten Commandments. You can know Genesis. You can know all those things. And I would love for you to know every piece of Scripture. I would love for you to have that all memorized. God bless your heart. It is a great thing. But if you don't have anything else memorized and ready to go, you better have the gospel. You better have the gospel. We have to have the gospel. We have to have the gospel ready. In Romans 1.16, Paul did not say, I am ashamed of something else. He said, I am unashamed of the gospel. Because I'm going to tell you something that happens. The more you proclaim the gospel the less friends of this world you are going to have. The more you proclaim the gospel, the more feelings and toes you are going to step on. Your Facebook friend list is going to go, whoop, it's going to shrink. Not just from posting scripture. You can copy and paste scripture all day and night. I'd love for you to share God's word, but you proclaim the gospel enough, it's going to make people uncomfortable. And it's going to make them uncomfortable because they don't believe. And now all of a sudden, you have challenged them, not by your own words, but by the words of God, because what it says is true. And it says 
that you are a sinner who needs a Savior. God has provided that Savior. and Faith must be placed in Him. It requires an action. And that hurts people's feelings that are clung on to something that is not the gospel. They don't like it. You can hurt their feelings just by telling them the truth nowadays. That's enough to hurt anybody's feelings. We don't seek to hurt people's feelings. That's not what I'm sitting there doing. I'm not standing there telling you to go stand in the trailer park and just cuss people out and let them have it. That might hurt their feelings. That might get you killed. Go forward proclaiming the gospel. What got Paul in trouble was that every time authorities came against him, what did he keep doing? He kept preaching the gospel. He admonished the Galatians. Why have you fallen for a false gospel? He gets on the Corinthians in chapter 1, verse 22. I say this, or Paul says this. He said, the Jews require a sign, the Greeks seek wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified unto the Jews a stumbling block and unto the Greeks foolishness. But unto them which are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God, and the wisdom of God. Because the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. But those first two I key in on. The Jews require a sign, and the Greeks seek after wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified. And to the world, it is a stumbling block. It is in their way of living how they want. Your sinful flesh wants to live in sin. It feels natural for your selfish, your sinful flesh to live in those ways. It requires a change to live in the word of the God and in the gospel. It is going to require a change. It is going to require repentance. It is going to require a change of direction. It's going to change a lot of things. It's going to change the way you look at people. All of a sudden, you're going to walk into funeral homes and you're not going to be sitting there looking at the flower arrangements and how nice the casket looks. You're going to be sitting there like, I don't know if they were saved. Hopefully you go in and you know and you have that blessed assurance. You might walk in there and not know. And that's an uncomfortable spot to be in. But you know what? Whether it's a wedding, whether it's a funeral, whether it's a Sunday school class or vacation Bible school or whatever we're having, Awanas, whatever it may be, the gospel needs to be taught and proclaimed. And it might require a little bit of your time to do so. Because the last thing you want to do is get to heaven and be like, well, I could have got these, but I would have rather went home. It's going to require you. It's going to require things of you. You are not going to be saved by those works. You are saved for those works. The gospel needs to be proclaimed. It needs to be proclaimed to the person that believes they are religious just as much as it needs to be proclaimed to the person who has never heard the word of God. We must know the gospel and we must go forward proclaiming the gospel. We should not take part in any activity as a church that is not centered around proclaiming the gospel. If we have a car wash here, great. I'm sure people would love to get their car washed for free. But in that moment of time where they're standing outside of the car, have someone there that's like, hey brother, do you know Jesus as your Lord and Savior? Do you know that he died on the cross for your sins? If you go to a wedding, weddings are great, beautiful, wonderful things. We got nice, fancy dresses. We got, you know, wearing a lot nicer suits than I got on now. We got everybody's invited and we got all our rustic, you know, we're married out in a barn in the field. There better be a presentation of the gospel at that wedding and at that funeral. Whether the person was saved or unsaved, whether you know or you're unsure, there better be the gospel getting proclaimed. I'll tell you this as I close. This got me, it hit me right in the heart. First funeral I had to do. You know, it's my family member. So obviously I'm related to some of these people here. And it was, oh, I did not want to do it at all. I did not. I just wanted to sit in the crowd 
And I just wanted to mourn like everybody else. I, I really did. I was, I was being selfish. But in that moment, my feelings were saying, you know, oh, please, just get somebody from the funeral home to do it. Please, I hope to God she had a preacher. Like, let somebody else do it. And there was nobody else. It, it was me. I had to go do it. And I gave as part of the service. Obviously, you do the obituary. You, you do all the things to go about. You talk about the person. You talk about, thankfully, it was a family member that was saved, and I knew they were saved. So I proclaimed that they were a believer of the gospel. And then I gave a presentation of the gospel that God has reached out. He has extended enough mercy to reach out, but you must come to him. And I had somebody a year later reach out, not to me directly, through somebody else. And they said, you know, so-and-so is really thankful that you did that because they didn't know they needed Jesus to get to heaven. And I, at first, I reacted with arrogance. I was like, who don't know that you need Jesus to get to heaven? And then I got humbled. And I was like, oh my, what if I had not done it? What if I hadn't said what I thought was plain and obvious to anybody with a cross around their neck? Not everybody knows. A lot of people wear cross necklaces, don't know who Jesus is. A lot of people got Bibles, don't know who Jesus is. A lot of people go to church, don't know who Jesus is. Don't know that it is a requirement to get to heaven, to eternal life. There is a requirement. A lot of them don't know John 3, 18. Maybe you know somebody today that maybe you've always thought they were saved, but maybe today is the day to go and ask. Maybe tomorrow when you see them at work. Maybe when you see them at the gas station. Hey, Bill, how's it going? Hey, brother, how you doing? Start a conversation and get to the point quickly. Brother, do you know that Jesus died for your sins? I don't know what answer you're going to get. But I hope and pray that you take John 3, 14 through 18. If you just take that and go forward and proclaim the gospel. Because they need it just like you needed it. Just like you still need it. Just like we need it every day. I am leaning on the everlasting arms of a God that even though I in my flesh have sinned against, that he loved me enough to pay my debt with his son. And therefore, because he's been so good to me,